Thanks very much, Daniel. So it's great to be here and the opportunity to talk about uh, Atom Probe to, to the group. This is, as I was saying earlier, the first time I've been into the office for several months. So it's given me a, a good opportunity to come to work, not work from home. Uh, so today, I, I mean, uh, I'm going to talk about Atom Probe. I work for Kamika. So Kamika has played a key role in developing Atom Probe, together with a small number of the historical FIM APT groups uh, scattered around the world, uh, around the world. So we have a sort of a more than 20 year history of commercializing the instruments. So what I'm going to talk about today really is give an introduction to the method, uh, briefly talk about you know what it does, how it operates, uh, a little bit about the data analysis, and and a brief. Uh, introduction to the specimen preparation. Uh, and then I'm going to show some application examples, uh, hopefully in 20 minutes. Um, I have a, a couple of traditional metallurgical examples, but they're additive manufacturing materials to make them more exciting. And to then move away from metallurgy, I'm going to show an example of uh, a non-metal system, which is a, a zeolite material, so a catalyst. Uh, and then talk about um, some new capabilities that's come to Atom Pro, mimicking really TEM capabilities. So the ability to do uh, cryo, full, full cryo transfer and specimen uh, preparation, transfer and analysis. And then I'll show briefly a couple of examples that are enabled by this new capability. And then if I'm good, I will leave plenty of time for discussion. So um, I think everyone here is fully aware of the importance of characterization. And really, if you want to do material science and you know, understand how your materials uh, work and how to make them better, you need knowledge of the microstructure. Of course, microscopy is the key enabling technology for this. And you know, electron microscope methods are ubiquitously used now, I think. So I'm not gonna talk about how those work, but I'm just going to contrast in this slide how the Atom Pro provides information and how and why it's complementary. So if you have, for example, an interesting material system here, um, which is a super alloy system with a coarse two-phase microstructure, if you use your electron microscope and zoom in, you can see at high magnification, um, you can see the coarse structure, the matrix, and some fine structure as well. And you can get a variety of, of course, structural and then analytical information from the you know, whole panoply of methods that are available. But the Atom Probe gives you information in a completely different way. In a sense, in essentially what we do is we remove atoms from your material one at a time, and we give you the position and the identity. So it gives you this unique uh, compositional imaging capability. So if we take an atom probe data set from this same material uh, where we can see we have a coarse phase which is iron rich with light contrast in the SEM. You know in our atom probe data if we just show the iron atoms we get these darkly orange areas. In this case we've got iron as orange. And so it just basically by looking at the different color of the data which is represented by the you know the 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 array of atoms within our data set, we can get compositional information. And so we can use techniques like ISO concentration surface rendering to, to capture and describe interfaces. In this case, the transition from the iron rich phases to the uh, nickel aluminum matrix. And so we can just capture those uh, surfaces, but because we have inherently high spatial resolution in, this, in the atom probe, you know, this capability extends down to very fine scale features. So we have the capability to, by measuring the composition, to tell you an awful lot about the microstructure and all the compositional changes within your material. Uh, and it's, what's really nice is as well, it's, you know, fully tomographic three-dimensional method. So we get the data in three dimensions and give you a very complete description of the microstructure of your materials. So um, that's a brief introduction to you know, what's good about it, 
what, what the, why the results or data is useful. Um, so to move on to the fundamentals of how the technique works, uh, moving atoms one at a time sounds uh, a little bit like magic, or it probably used to do uh, a, long, a, good while, a good while ago. But essentially what we use is a high field to uh, remove the atom. So if you have a flat surface, uh, you know, you need a really very high field to do that. You need a bit to apply an extraordinarily high voltage because we need to get tens of volts per nanometer to stimulate this surface ion removal. Fortunately, if your service is curved, then this gives you um, field enhancement. You need less voltage. And so if you can make a specimen, which is a sharp needle with a tip radius of 100 nanometers, or something like that, for a you know, modest specimen voltage, we can achieve the fields we need. So this concept was first used, you know, 50 or more years ago uh, in the field ion microscope and was the first method that achieved atomic resolution imaging in 1956. So here's an example of a tungsten uh, or a field in a thin image of a BCC method. So each of those rings are atomic uh, uh, you know, planes and we get really nice imaging. So the atom probe was the more recent development of this. And so to, to just to stress how we get the spatial resolution or the magnification, essentially we've got a big detector and a very small specimen, and it's a projection microscope. So the field lines define the trajectories of the ions, and we get something like a million times magnification in this, in this method, and that's how we could see individual atoms effectively in the thin image on the previous slide. <clears throat> so if in the atom probe, which has been around since the 60s, uh, it was conceived in the 1960s and has been really commercialized uh, in the last two or three decades, we still use the field iron effect. We still have the same needle shaped specimen. It's kept cool because we want to preserve spatial resolution. Uh, and then the key parts of the atom probe, which are more modern really, are the position sensitive single ion detector. So we want to be able to remove single ions from the specimen and you know, encode the arrival position in X, Y on our detector when they, when they arrive at it, okay? So that gives us our arrival position, which allows us to infer the original position from on the specimen. And uh, in order to get the elemental identity, we use time of flight mass spectrometry. So what that means is we have to basically know when the ion departed from the specimen and when it arrives in the detector. So in order to get the departure time, we use a pulsing method. So we have a DC field, uh, which is high, you know, high, but insufficient to allow evaporation to commence. And then we apply an AC we stimulate the evaporation either by using field pulsing, uh, voltage pulse, or by a laser pulse. And if we apply a pulse with a very short duration, we get a very uh, well-described departure time. So we, we can measure the time of flight, and that gives us the elemental identity of the, of the, of the ion that's arriving. So we know the order of arrival, and so that, in a simple way, allows us to um, basically gather data, finish the experiment, and then we're able to uh, convert the data into a 3D point cloud, which is a kind of a, uh, a simulation of the, of the analyzed volume of material. Okay, so the Z comes from the order of arrival of the ions. If we're using the reconstruction method, it's very simple. It uses the assumption that we have a, a hemispherical end surface for the specimen. We have the position on the detector and we deproject it using the current magnification at the time of collection onto this um, position on the, on the model surface. And each time we add an ion, we basically increment the depth. And so that allows us to build up our third dimension in the data. So this is very simple method, there's lots and lots of developments ongoing to improve and extend the capability of this reconstruction.
Okay, so um, we, we get compositional information, uh, and really what the key to this is our time of flight mass spectrum. So we collect all the ions and we time when they arrive. And really this mass spectrum defines the bulk composition of our analyzed volume. And we use the software and some human interaction to allocate identities to the peaks. And then we basically measure the number of ions under each peak. And when we go through the entire uh, mass spectrum, this builds up the bulk composition of the, of the data set. And then when we have the 3D volume rendered, then we have you know, the compositional variation in, in the three dimensions, which once we've reconstructed it, then we can use the data, data analysis. Okay, so um, just to give you an idea of the, of the data analysis, clearly there's a lot of um, visualization you can do with looking at uh, where the different atoms are and looking for compositional changes. Uh, you can do this and that's great, but really Atom Probe is a, it's a quantitative technique. It's for measuring you know, local concentrations and changes. And so that, this is really where the, uh, where the core of the data analysis capability is. So just to give you a, a, an, a insight into the very basic functions that can be used, we have a two phase material here, which aluminum is shown in blue. So one phase has more aluminum in it. So we can render an isoconcentration surface at a fixed aluminum level. So we're basically defining the transition between the uh, high aluminum and low aluminum region, which is in effect highlighting the interface. This allows us to define surfaces uh, and interfaces. And so we could do things like just extract specific features like this small precipitate and look at the atoms from within it. So we have the spatial resolution to be able to do it. I mean, this is the key capability really of the technique. Okay, so we get the local mass spectrum and we can tabulate the internal composition of any feature like this. Of course, clearly we can do concentration profiling in a number of ways, either by defining a cylinder, measuring the, the concentration along the cylinder in user definable increments of depth, the number of ions. So we can measure the, what's changing. So here we have a matrix and a precipitate phase. And remember we use the aluminum concentration to define the interface. Here we go from low aluminum in the matrix, relatively high in the precipitate phase. There are some other ways, a number of other ways of analyzing the data. So we can use the interface itself to do the comp concentration measurement in the so-called proximity histogram method. Uh, so this has some advantages in averaging uh, over the shape of the material. It also allows us to separate curvature from a, uh, from a, from a measurement of concentration change across the surface. And it also allows us to, if we have many features, so this is a small feature with only a few few tens of thousands of atoms. We can measure the bulk, uh, what the bulk phase is, but if we're looking for you know, subtle effects, we may not have the counting statistics to do that. However, we have the ability to you know, analyze data in a, you know, in a relatively sophisticated way. So we can go from one to one feature to all of the features. We increase the surface area or the number of atoms we're measuring significantly. And that allows us to pull out you know, relatively subtle composition effects. So here's an example of in this superalloy system. Now we're able to, we're counting enough atoms now that we're able to actually quantify the amount of tungsten that's uh, segregated to the interface. Okay, so that allows us to measure the interfacial excess directly because we know the surface area of the interfaces and we can you know, measure the number of tungsten atoms. So observations like this, have a real impact in understanding things like uh, high temperature creep performance, for example. Okay, and um, so we've seen a couple of examples of showing it's you know really nice capability of looking at precipitates and phase uh, evolution. Here's another aluminium example. It's quite old now. It's um, this is a you know a seven series aluminium. It's an example where if you use 
uh, electron microscopy methods, it's hard to understand what's going on in the early stages of aging. So here we were able to see at low temperature aging within a few minutes, the hardness has changed significantly. And you can't really see what's happening in the, in the electron microscope. Because the atom probe, as we've said before, we're measuring the position of all of the atom species. It's possible for us to study or look for changes in the distribution of different solid elements in the matrix. And so if we want to study the precipitate forming elements, for example, we can look for any evolution in loss of uh, homogeneity in those distributions. And in this case, the atom probe clearly does detect that the aging or the, you know, this hardness change is associated with, su with subtle changes in the uh, matrix solute elements. And basically we are able to quantify the number of clusters that are being formed. Okay. And there are statistical methods for doing this. So it's a, it's a key capability for atom probe. It's really, it's really a, you know, one of the key uh, capabilities. Okay, so these clusters can be very small, you know, a few, a few, just a few atoms. So give it a quick introduction to, or a very brief introduction to ways to analyze or view the data. So we have a IVAS data analysis package, um, which has been, you know, is regularly updated. Um, and I would encourage you if you go on atomprobe.com, you, uh, you can apply for a, a, free, a freeware version of this IBAS license with some test data. So if you want to learn how to do Atom Probe data analysis, uh, you can do that and we will send you a dongle and some example data. Of course, we also sell licenses uh, which are fully configured. Uh, and so, you know, that's generally what people use to we provide those the people who are collaborating with people or people who have their own instruments uh, available. Uh, and we have a major up, update which has just happened um, uh, in the last six months, which has some nice new features. So we're starting to allow the introduction of uh, third party developed data analysis algorithms. Uh, so we're allowing the community to you know, develop new methods and share them to really extend the analytical capability of, or extend what can be done to atom probe data. Um, okay, so to give you a quick idea of a bit of history, I mean, atom probe has a relatively long history from the 70s through the 90s. It was a niche technique, it's a metallurgical technique. But in the last 15 years with the introduction of laser mode, uh, the range of uses have been expanded dramatically uh, away from, and then we're no longer limited to looking at electrically conducting materials. So there's uh, analyses used across a very wide range of material science, functional materials and uh, devices, even the geological materials and rocks. And we're moving into uh, you know, soft and biological materials as well. Okay. So um, people who are familiar with a DEM know that you have to have a sample or a specimen in the form of a, a lamella, which you can get your electrons to pass through. So in atom probe, we've also, we also need to have a sharp needle so that we can use the field iron effect uh, as well. So we need to be able to make specimens. Historically, you can do this by electropolishing. It works with a very wide variety of structural materials. And it's very simple. You basically get a bulk bit of material, you saw a bit off, and then you can electropolish it into a needle. So it has the benefit of being simple and relatively inexpensive. Um, and it's still important for many cases, if you have you know, an, a, an atom probe and you have some constraints on FIB access, making the ability to electropolish uh, samples is a really useful and it remains very effective way of making samples. But the main limitation really is that you, it's, it's not site specific. So you want to look at a specific grain boundary or a feature, you know, it's, it's not, it becomes ineffective at doing that. So of course, we all know that, um, you know, FIB stem is a fantastic general method to make specimens. If you can put it in the 
FIB chamber, you can make a sample out of it using standard, you know, well, well known lift out and mount methods. So in the Atom probe, we use very similar techniques to those, you know, used in electron microscopy. We, we have a slightly different mounting strategy. So we can, we can, you can use a needle, pre-sharpened needle, or we have, we have silicon coupons with these um, flat top micro tips. They're really efficient for mounting, putting bits of material on you want to make into an atom probe specimen. And then you can do the sharpening using an annular milling approach. So, you know, this is obviously clearly very widely used uh, in, the, in the community. And of course, having the electron imaging capability is very useful for, um, you know, for targeting and understanding your material. Okay, so the first example, a classic example I'm gonna just go through here is um, a steel uh, case study. So this is, um, and it's uh, a mar aging steel, so a high performance steel uh, produced by in an, using additive manufacturing. And the, the idea is really that the, potentially if you're wanting to make uh, injection molding hardware, Meraging steel is a perfect material, and if you can use additive manufacturing, then you can really, uh, it's, there's some real benefits from being able to produce these parts in a fast, convenient way. So these materials have been studied for quite a long time. They have great material properties, but they're relatively expensive, and you know, they get their, they get their properties from formation of really quite complex intermetallic a range of phases. Uh, with the electron microscope, you can really observe these phases, but the sheer complexity of, the, uh, of some of these materials means that getting a full you know, 3D understanding of, the, of this structure is quite difficult. Atom probe tomography, because of its 3D nature and the way that we can resolve the separate phases gives you some real opportunities to you know, improve your understanding of these materials. So it's known that they have a range of different phases. So in this case, the material was produced by additive manufacturing and then annealed into, into a number of, it was solutionized and then heated at different aging conditions to try and replicate you know, the optimum um, mechanical properties state. So in this, in this case, I'm showing the specimen preparation we used a partial electro polishing, and we finished with the focus on the just to get consistent shapes. Okay, so here is some atom map showing the raw data. Really, this is an example that's been annealed for a long time at the low temperature condition. So we can see that all of the non-iron elements that are added are significantly they're not homogeneously distributed. We have some formation. Of but there's quite a lot going on in these materials. Okay, so if we remember the scale bar there is about 50 nanometers. If we then look at the 50 degrees C two hour anneal condition, then we can see that uh, we have a similar microstructure in this case, but it's probably slightly more, it's got a slightly finer structure. At least visually it looks that way. And then at 600 degrees, the high temperature anneal for 10 hours, it's clearly a much coarser microstructure, so not the optimum um, uh, condition that's being looked for. Okay, so really the, the, the unit, the really nice thing about the atom probe is that, you know, we can just investigate the local composition of each of these phases using a variety of methods. Here I'm showing isoconcentration surfaces. So here we're just looking at, um, we're looking for regions which are enriched in, enriched in titanium. And this allows us to capture the uh, Ni3Ti uh, spherical precipitates. So really we're just drawing a surface around all of the volume which has elevated titanium. It allows us to detect these features. We can do the same with this uh, looking at enriched nickel regions and this allows us to extract the, uh, these uh, plate-like, um, sorry, the nickel three molybdenum uh, precipitates. And then there is another type of precipitate, which is uh, iron. 
So if we put them all together, I mean, it's quite complicated as we can see with the previous uh, results. But again, the nice thing with the atom probe is that we can characterize these, in, you know, we can separate in three dimensions each of these different types of uh, precipitate formation. And that allows us to do things like look at the number density or the volume fraction of these precipit precipitates as a function of the individual species or collectively overall. And in this case, this material, if we show, um, this is data from a commercially available uh, similar material from BOLA, and it shows that in those cases, in that case of material, these aging conditions were also, you know, the ones giving the optimum uh, mechanical properties. So in this case, the, I mean, the Atterbro allows you to confirm that it's really the, the number density of these precipitates that primarily is responsible for, um, for giving you these, these properties, the optimal properties. Okay. Um, so another example of a, a study, at this time looking at a, a titanium-based uh, material, again, pre prepared by 3D printing. And in this case, the, the people were trying to study the AM material and compare its, its properties or the microstructure with the traditionally prepared material. And the target of this demo that we did for them was they really wanted to confirm the vanadium presence at this specific uh, alpha beta interface. And so what we did was we used FibSem specimen preparation, but we also used transmission mode EBSD or TKD to look at the specimen as it was being prepared and basically identify this specific feature. So it allows us to target the very, you know, very precisely uh, the, the exact feature that we're looking, looking at. Okay. And so this, the results were, we were able to provide the results to the, to our collaborator and uh, they were able to see that, uh, you know, that they were able to measure the, the vanadium concentration directly. Another area of interest here for additive manufacturing, particularly these materials, which are highly reactive, they're very effective getters, is contamination. So we're, we were looking at also at oxygen and seeing what levels of oxygen were, uh, were entrained within the various, uh, uh, within these materials. And there's a number of studies going on, which particularly looking at the effect of uh, well, looking at oxygen contamination in the feed material, so the raw material, and if that is affected by you know, recycling material, so you, reusing powder that isn't, uh, isn't used during the first process to see you know, what extent oxygen uh, poisoning is a problem with uh, recycling material. Because in many cases with additive manufacturing, although people claim that there is really advantages of, you know, fly to buy ratio. If you can only use a few percent of the feed material without throwing it away, then a lot of those advantages are, are diminished. Okay, so a final example that I want to show you was moving away from the metallurgy samples and, and showing uh, a nice example with a more novel, traditionally anyway, out probe materials. So looking at catalyst materials, catalysts are very, I mean, important economically uh, and environmentally. And this is a collaboration uh, between a couple of our existing atom probe users and a number of uh, universities around the world. Um, so this is specific zeolite, uh, which is being studied. So zeolites have some interesting properties. They have a number of uh, uses, uses in catalysis. They're kind of molecular sieves, so they have porosity, which can be tuned to match different molecules. Um, and this example material is, is used for catalytic cracking in the petrochemical industry. Um, they're known to have uh, reduced performance with, during a lifetime. And so this was an experiment where you looked at some as formed material and you compared it, we can, it was compared with material that had been treated to simulate end of life. So it had gone through a high temperature steam process. Okay, so the atom probe specimen preparation was performed to, to allow us to look at the aluminium distribution. That's what's 
it's understood to be you know, critically responsible for the catalytic uh, capability of these materials. And to see where the aluminium was present and how its distribution was changing throughout this uh, treatment, which simulated end of life. So pretty standard uh, specimen preparation, but in this case, you know, because we want to preserve the integrity of the surface, there's probably was some efforts to deposit some capping materials on these zeolites just to make sure there was no contamination during the handling and specimen preparation processes. Okay, so the real challenge was to see what was uh, to detect the aluminium and to you know understand how its how its distribution was changing. So in the as formed material, which hasn't been exposed or degraded, you know, in the mass, we can see the mass spectrum uh, here, um, 0 to 60. Aluminium can clearly be seen at in two charge states in our data. So aluminium triply charged and doubly charged. And if we look at the distribution of, alum, of aluminium or aluminum in the, uh, in the data set, visually it looks very uh, randomly distributed. It doesn't look to be as if there's any a strong, you know, non-homogeneity present. So if we then compared those results with the uh, data collected from the, uh, from the end of life sample, here we can see that there was quite profound differences in the aluminium concentration. So instead of a randomly distributed aluminium in the matrix or within the material, we had some significant clustering going on. And also we have a grain boundary here, which was confirmed with you know, uh, correlative stem imaging with the sample before analysis. So we also have this crane boundary, which is richly decorated with these clusters and has strong aluminium segregation to it. So clearly these uh, results are very different. Um, the, al the aluminium is losing its randomly distributed nature in the bulk material, and it's becoming, it's, it's, it's moving uh, together to form clusters. And so, of course, the Diatom probe allows us to quantify you know, how constant, how, to what extent these clusters are concentrated in aluminium. And so we can see here in, in these features, we have something like, you know, more than 10% of al aluminium in these features. Um, and then we can contrast looking at simple I said visually the data was random in the previous uh, case, but um, basically we can do statistical tests to confirm randomness in atom probe data. So here, if we look at the parent material, um, if we do a simple test for randomness where we chop the data up into arbitrarily up into little boxes and count the number of aluminium atoms that we get, or we can look at the average aluminium to aluminium pair distance, uh, this is indicative of random distribution. Here in the as treated material, uh, clearly we're moving away from this random distribution to have some regions with very little aluminium and then obviously a smaller number of, uh, smaller regions of material, the clusters which have elevated uh, aluminium content. So we can quantify the, to, to the, the extent to which the you know, aluminium is being lost from, from the, what we think is the effective aluminium within the matrix. Okay, so moving on, uh, all of the examples I've shown before of using standard specimen preparation where we have to expose the material after we take it out of the fib, for example, to atmosphere. So it presents some limitations on material systems that are uh, environmentally sensitive or prone to temperature, effects of temperature. Uh, and so this project is discussing really uh, uh, developing methods for being able to transfer specimens in UHP so we eliminate the uh, atmospheric contamination and also the ability to keep them cold. So we can do full cryo transfer from specimen prep to analysis. Okay, so the project was really a collaboration with MPIE. There have been earlier prototypes, but this was a big uh, scheme to basically develop an infrastructure so that you could share 
specimens between their key instruments whilst you know, preserving UHV conditions and keeping the samples cold. So we have our atom probe, we have a glove box, a fib, and we use this UHV portable suitcase between to move the samples around. So in practice, this looks like the Flash project's been going for several years. They're starting to publish a lot of nice data. So now this is a, something that you can commercially buy. You can buy one of these, uh, we call it, it's a vacuum biotransfer module, VCTM. And so it simply is a, it's a modification to the LEAP vacuum system and this portable suitcase. And you can choose to have a UHV connector or a quick fit type style. <clears throat> Okay, so this is what it looks like. So we have an enhanced vacuum system, and then we have this uh, suitcase chamber, which can be attached or dismantled and taken to other workstations. Just quickly summarize, you know, this has been developed to be relatively easy to use, it's properly interlocked, and the sample exchange is essentially like, uh, it's the same as sample exchange within the loop. So we have the same puck, it sits in this vacuum chamber here during transfer, which is UHV. And then when you want to chain transfer it, you've got the transfer arm, you can put it into the normal uh, carousel and do the normal transfer that you normally would. So, you know, this is now, there's a number of these around the world. It's starting to be widely, starting to be used. And then people are developing the infrastructures to, you know, integrate this into FIBSEMS and other, other workstations. Um, so, and I'm, I'm going to go very quickly through this because I've only got a few minutes left before I want to move to, to questions. But, so the question really, um, one of the, there's several motivations for doing this uh, or generating this new capability. Primary one has been really to try and uh, use Atom Probe effectively to measure hydrogen, particularly in structural materials. So because we have a, the atom probe is a time of flight technique, in principle, we can, we can measure hydrogen in materials. It, we're UHV technique, but the vacuum, residual vacuum is dominated by hydrogen. So there is always a background signal. So this is a nice proof of principle for doing this type of work 10 years ago from workers in Nippon Steel. They had a suitable material which has a stable um, deep, trap where they can uh, where they know they can put deuterium and it won't move at room temperature and so they charge the sample with and they did thermally programmed resorption experiments to know this they charged the specimen with deuterium transferred it at room temperature and they also basically looked at an uncharged piece of material to, as a control okay here's our mass spectrum from the uncharged material we have a peak at one dalton one at one Dalton due to the background hydrogen in our chamber. But in the tested material, uh, we have this one Dalton peak due to the background hydrogen. But the, the deuterium is clearly resolved at two Daltons, which then allowed them to show that this deuterium was occupying traps, which are at the interface between the matrix and these precipitates in this material. So direct observation of hydrogen uh, in these material systems. So, of course, this was looking, this is limited to material systems where there is, we know that the, there is low mobility uh, traps for hydrogen. If you want to really understand completely hydrogen role in these materials, you need to be able to prevent this mobility. And the only way to do that is to keep your samples cold. So this is an example, a proof of principle using the same experiment essentially, but with cryo transfer and was published in Science a couple of years ago. Um, so here's, here's the, the summary of this experiment. You know, if you use hydrogen, we know we get a background signal at one Dalton. Uh, so even if you charge with hydrogen, you, your, your signal is overlapped. So, okay, maybe you can infer a difference because if the signal is much bigger, but it's not really quantitative. However, if you use deuterium, you get a peak in principle, which is separated from hydrogen background. But if you don't use cryo, you're only going to capture the deuterium, which is associated with the deep traps. So in order to get the full picture, 
you need to combine deuterium charging with the cryo transfer. So here's this four peak at two. So that's one of the primary motivations for using the um, using this new transfer capability. It's, the, the real story is much more complicated than this, of course, but um, fortunately, I don't have time to get into that. Uh, maybe it's a good question. So I just wanted to show as a last thing, one example of a new material. So this is essentially a wet sample, which can now be studied in the atom probe. So it's a borosilicate glass, which is potentially going to be used for um, you know, storage of uh, hazardous materials. It has to be stable over many millennia in order to be safe. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a challenging measurement. The reaction zone is very small, so you need a high spatially resolved method. And it has a relatively complex uh, composition with light elements playing a key role. So the atom probe, you know, is perfectly suited to this. And now, if you you can basically do cryo specimen preparation, you can you can start to analyze these wet systems without having to go through a drying process and change the materials. So this is an example from the PNNL guys who built their own reaction chamber and basically uh, have done a lot of uh, pioneering work in figuring out how to adapt the specimen preparation methods to. Cryofib, which brings a number of challenges. So uh, a water-based solution with these glass particles in it then are used with the fib to make specimens to look at the reaction uh, front, though targeting the altered glass region. And so here is the result of much work figuring out how to make the specimen preparation work. Uh, and then looking at these these glass reaction zones, you know, historically they were able to look at the pristine glass ion exchange region because this was still really relatively structurally intact. But now you can do these water filled materials, they can start to move out into these more interesting areas. So this hydrated glass gel area. Uh, and so this is an analysis of the interface which nicely shows the changing in the chemistry to associated with the hydrated region and the, the uh, ion exchange region. Um, and so if you look at the atom probe data, you know, they're really starting to be able to observe, if you look at the hydrated internal region and compare the contrast with the more silicon rich region, you're probably starting to image the porosity of these uh, hydrated glass structures. It's consistent with their MD simulation. So this is a nice illustration of what you can start to do if you can look at complex structures which have water in them and you can start to you know, freeze these systems and then analyze them in the atom probe. Okay, so um, I, I've run over by five minutes. Um, a quick summary, um, you know, if you want to see small things, you have to use the light tool. The atom probe allows, it gives high spatial resolution, you know, it allows us to look at things that are one nanometer to 100 nanometers in size. Of course, you can use a microscope to do that as well, uh, but the atom probe has really good analytical capabilities because of our, of our individual atom counting method. It means we're getting close to the information limit for small analysis volumes, okay? Um, and of course, we see all isotopes and elements. Time of flight is a massive advantage there. Okay, and uh, so my final, final summary. Um, atom probe, I think is great, but then I'm biased. But it's, so it's highly comp complementary with the existing, you know, more workhorse electron microscopy tools. Um, there are more than 100 instruments around the world, which we think of as a lot. So I see that as it becoming increasingly accessible. And we're working to make the whole technique easier to use. Um, cryo capabilities, really continues the expansion of what you can do with atom probe. And there's some really exciting new areas, which, you know, soft materials, biological materials, we haven't talked about, but people are thinking about that. And so, you know, there, there really is, this is a good, this is a key time because the work is just starting to come out. So here's a nice paper, Frontiers, Materials Today Advantage, which is a review of the recent uh, 
results from cryo and vacuum transfer systems. Okay. And final point, um, I know many people are probably planning to go to a to M and M, but um, there is a really nice selection of talks scheduled for M and M. So if you have any interest in many of in many specific topics, I'm sure there's very likely to be they're likely to be addressed in two weeks' time at M and M. So um, I recommend if you're interested to consider viewing some of those talks because I think it's registering is very uh, is very cost effective at this point.